to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. To the unfaithful people of Israel, God said in the book of Hosea, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Hosea chapter 4, verse number 6. We welcome you today to our study of the Minor Prophets, beginning with the book of Hosea, which details the account of Israel's unfaithfulness and God's plea out of love by the example of Hosea and his unfaithful wife for them to come back to Almighty God. We're so glad that you joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Lord's Church and these Christians in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly, whether that be Sunday morning or maybe Sunday night or Wednesday night for Bible study. They would love to have you as a guest. You will find people there who, who love God, who love the Bible, who are concerned about lost souls, and who'd be happy to sit down and talk to you more about the gospel of Christ. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about the, the church or the plan of salvation or any biblical matter. These people be happy to sit down in your local congregation and talk to you about the Word of God and what God wants us to do to glorify and honor Him. Friend, we'd also like to help you here at the Gospel of Christ in your desire to know God and His Word better. If you'd like to have a copy of our series on the Minor Prophets, we'd be glad to make that available to you. Uh, you can go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to send you a digital download of audio or video in that format. Whatever way you need that, we'd be happy to make it available to you. Just let us know, write or call us at the information given as well at the end of this program. And friend, we want to encourage you to check out our website. There's a wide variety of good Bible study material. We've got a wide variety of topics, books of every book in the Old and New Testament, studies of every book in the Old and New Testament, a lot of written material, study guides, question and answers. Check us out, thegospelofchrist.com. And don't forget in our fast-paced world to download the Gospel of Christ app. It's available for both Android and iPhones. And it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons and what we're doing here at the Gospel of Christ. As you think about that series of books, the 12 Minor Prophets, let's begin by recognizing that the Minor Prophets are not minor versus major prophets in that their message is less important. You've got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel that we often think of as the major prophets, and then Hosea through Malachi and the minor prophets, but the only reason there's really that breakdown is some of the books in the major prophets are very large, and in the minor prophets, most of their messages are smaller in content not smaller in the effect that it might have had. In fact, some of the minor prophets are fiery, and we might say they're, they're like dynamite. They come in a small package, but they have a big booming message just as well. And such is the case today with our study of Hosea. Hosea is a plea for Israel to leave their life of spiritual adultery and unfaithfulness and come back to God who loves them and who's done so much for them. And so the key idea in Hosea is Israel's unfaithfulness to God and the consequence of that sin. And if they don't correct it, they're impending judgment. Now, what's really unique is the way God shows that to Israel through Hosea. Hosea is the name of the prophet of this book, and God says to Hosea, 
Hosea, I want you to take a wife of harlotry. I want you to marry a prostitute in essence. And Hosea marries her. He falls in love with her. He cares for her deeply. And yet this woman, Gomer by name, this prostitute, she's not faithful to Hosea. And as a result, she even has a child that Hosea says, not my son, a child out of her prostitution, and he has to take care of that, and it's a, a constant yo-yo effect, as it were. And so this represents, this is done to illustrate to Israel, look at what happened to Hosea through Gomer. This is what you're doing to me, and this is how I feel about it. And so God's trying to illustrate to them their need to be faithful to him. You see, there was no mercy, no truth, and no knowledge of God in the land of Israel. Hosea 4 verse 1. This is why God says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. In fact, the key word in the book of Hosea is the word return. God wants them. He mentions this 15 times throughout the book, how he is pleading with them to come back to God. And that's what this harlot wife illustration is all about. Look at Hosea chapter 1 and, and notice what God says in verse number 2. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry. Why? For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. When God told Hosea to do that, that was an object lesson for Israel. Can you imagine? A prophet of God taking a prostitute as a wife, him loving her, trying to be the good husband he ought to be, and she just can't give up that prostitution, still has her lovers, even has a child that's not his out of wedlock. Uh, anybody would feel sorry for Hosea and the position that he's in. But Hosea represents God, and that harlot Gomer represents Israel and the children that are being born in that, the children out of wedlock, are children that are not faithful to God either. And you can see how that makes God feel. And that's what God is trying to get across to Hosea. But you know, there's more to it than that. Friend, what about the message to God's children today? Do we ever have times in our life where we're not faithful to God? Do we ever have times in our life when we flirt with sin and we flirt with the world and we're not living or doing like we ought to do. How does that make God feel? About the same way Gomer made Hosea feel when she wasn't faithful to him. You see that that flirting with the world. God doesn't want us to do that. James 4 verse 4 James says in language that is so reminiscent of what Gomer did, adulterers and adulteresses do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. John said in the long ago, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. Why? For all that is in the world, lust the flesh, lust the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but is of the evil one. And the world and all that's in it is passing away. But he who does the will of God We'll live forever. Friend, just like Gomer, we need to look to our lives and we need to ask, am I being faithful to God? Am I really serving God like I need to? Am I living up to that high and holy calling of being a Christian? Or do sometimes we flirt with the world and the spiritual adultery that is out there? You know, as God gives this message to the people of Israel, one of the things that he reminds them of is how that their sin brings a separation between them of God, them and God, and, and literally makes them illegitimate children. Look in Hosea chapter 1, verse 9, and I want you to see the illustration of this. After Hosea has taken Gomer as a wife, they have a child, verse number 9. Then God said, Call his name Lo. Ah, me, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. This sin that they've got entangled in, the idolatry, the wanting to be like the heathen nations, their, their desire to be a part of the world and everything around them, 
separated them from God, not legitimate children, made them uh, in that process of spiritual adultery. And friend, when we flirt with the world and when we get caught up in that, are we any different than the prodigal son of Luke chapter 15, who was out there living it up until the day he found himself eating the slop in the pig pen? You see, sin separates us from Almighty God. Isaiah 59 Verses 1 and 2, Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Well, where was Israel's hope in all of this? Their hope lied in a valley, a valley that takes us back to a very interesting event that happens in Israel's history. Look in Hosea chapter 2, and I want you to notice verse number 15. God said, I will give her, her vineyards from there. This is if they'll return. And the valley of Acre as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. What's, what's the hope for Israel? This valley of Acre, what does it represent? Any Israelite would immediately know what the valley of Acre represented. Joshua chapter 7 with the sin of Achan. They have gone into the battle of Ai. Ai is just a little old town. They don't even send everybody over there. And they think they're going to beat up on Ai pretty quick. And they lose 36 men. Israel loses 36 men in that battle. Why? Because of Achan's sin, of not obeying God. How did they correct that? They got sin out of the camp. They separated that. My friend, if Israel is going to get right with God and going to return to him in faithfulness. They've got to purge the idolatry, the wickedness, and the sin out of the camp. Just like in 1 Corinthians 5, the church has got to do the same. We cannot allow people who are living in sin, openly, blatantly, willingly living in sin, to continue like everything's okay. You've got to purge out the old leaven, Paul would say, and draw a line of fellowship and not have anything to do with those who are not living faithful to Almighty God to set an example and to live as God wants us to live. But my friend, the main problem is that these people who'd been in this for so long in this spiritual adultery and their children who were a product of their unfaithfulness they don't have the knowledge of God and his will that they needed to. Listen to what God says in Hosea chapter 4, verse number 6. God says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. That law that God gave Israel in the book of Exodus, that law that he repeated to the new generation in the book of Deuteronomy, that, that Ten Commandment law that they were bound to as a covenant, they'd pretty much thrown that aside. Some of them didn't even know what it required, that they didn't know what made them unique and different and how to serve and worship and live correctly for God. And God says, my people are going down a path of destruction because they just don't know me or my law. You're going to be rejected. Your people, your children are going to be rejected. And that is not what God wanted for them. Friend, when we think about this principle today, one of the great living messages of the book of Hosea is we must not put ourselves in a state where we don't know God in his word. 2 Timothy 2.15 encourages every one of us, study to show yourself approved unto God. I need to make sure I know God and I know his law under the New Testament, how God wants me to live, how he wants me to behave, how he wants to glor be glorified and worship in our lives. This is why we want to search the scriptures daily. Acts 17 verse 11 this is why Christians are taught to be ready always. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. Jesus said, you, can know, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I have a personal responsibility. Anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus 
has a personal responsibility to know God's will, to know what the Lord wants us to do. We, we cannot claim ignorance. God gave us the Bible so that we can know him and know what pleases and honors God. You see, part of the problem during the time of Hosea is their spiritual leaders weren't giving the message and being good spiritual leaders like they should have been. There's an old phrase that says, as the priest goes, so goes the people. Look at Hosea chapter 4, and I want you to notice what's said in verse number 9. And it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. What's God saying there? The, 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 the priest who should have known the law, known how to worship, known what was acceptable to God, and were ministering and, and tending there at the, the, in the service of God. They weren't giving the people and requiring of the people and reminding them of the law of God. Things were just kind of going along like everything was okay. Jeremiah said it this way. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The priests prophesy falsely, the prophets rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. But God said, what will you do in the end? You know, when I think about this principle in the Lord's church, in the home, and in our nation today, we need, we need good, godly elders who will put the word of God out for the people, who will encourage us to follow that, who will set an example. We need gospel preachers who will give a thus saith the Lord. We need leaders in the home, fathers and mothers, who will set a standard of right and wrong and who will give a good example to follow in our nation. We need godly leaders who will set that tone. And then once the tone is set, people can try their best to live up to that in every way. But you know, there was a major problem that's illustrated in Hosea chapter 5, verse number 4. And again, it emphasizes the theme of Hosea 4, verse 6. Listen to these words. Hosea 5, verse 4. God said they do not direct their deeds toward turning to their God, for the spirit of harlotry is in their midst. And listen to this. And they do not know the Lord. This spirit of harlotry. They're not directing and turning their deeds back to God. What's all that about? Israel had a rebellious spirit. Israel had a spirit of harlotry, meaning that they wanted to flirt with and they wanted to have that relationship with the world and they wanted to be like everybody else. They just didn't know. They didn't, they didn't know what, what they needed to do and they didn't understand how important it was to be faithful to Almighty God. Friend, let's make sure that we realize that flirting with the world and having a relationship with the world and flirting with sin and getting involved in sin, let's make sure we realize how deadly that is. The soul who sins will surely die, Ezekiel 18.4. The Bible clearly teaches that our sins separate us from a loving God. You can't live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church and act like everything's okay. Do you remember what Jesus said? Where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. What we look at, what we think about, what we flirt with, where we put our interest, that's where our heart is. And so we need to make sure that we know the consequences of what we're doing and how to serve God to the best of our ability. My friend, as we think about these ideas, I want you to see the, the fickle nature of some of these people's faith and how they just didn't have the type of faith that they needed to have. Look in Hosea chapter 6, and I want you to see what the Bible says about these people in verse 6. Look at their fickle nature in Hosea 6. Back up to verse number 4. O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? Listen to their fickle nature. For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud and like the early dew, it goes away. Their fickleness is like the morning cloud, like the early dew. What's that all about? You see it for a little while, then it's gone. 
It's just here and there almost. It wasn't anything that controlled their life. It might have been momentary. They might have got a, a feeling to serve God for a little while, but they were so fickle. They really didn't have their faith founded like it needed to be. It reminds me of some in the book of Jude. They were like that, that cloud in the book of Jude, that dark cloud coming, and then it passed by and it never gave anything good. Friend, I need to make sure my faith is built on a solid foundation, the rock of Matthew chapter 7. I need to make sure that I'm in it for the long haul, that it's not a momentary flash in the pan, get emotional for a little while, and then next thing you know, I'm back in the world. Don't be fickle in your faith. Have a faith that's grounded in the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, and that takes deep roots in God and his love and his mercy and his grace. And in doing that, we're reminded to put first things first. We're reminded to think about our priorities in life. Look at Hosea 6, verse 6. God says this. What are first things first? God says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. They may have still have had the ritual. They may have been going up to the temple. They may have been offering the sacrifices. Their heart wasn't in it. God said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. A knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Making sure that we have the right motive. That we're doing it for the right reason. That we're thinking about putting first things first. Friend, that's something that every one of us on a daily basis We've got to remind ourselves of what's really important. What is it that is of most value? Jesus said in Mark 8, 36 and 37, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? We talk about first things first and priority. Friend, realize your soul, you have an eternal soul. That soul is going to survive beyond the temporary here and now. You're going to be accountable. I'm going to be accountable for how I live my life and how I respond to the gospel of Jesus every day. Making sure I put my soul in a right spot with God. Of all things, that's putting first things first, most definitely. Now, let me show you how Hosea, to the people of Israel, tries to vividly illustrate the consequences of their sin against God. Look in Hosea chapter 8, and I want you to notice what the Bible says, and this is such a graphic illustration. Hosea 8, look in verse number 7. The Bible says, They sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. The stalk has no bud. It shall never produce meal. If it should produce, aliens would swallow it up. What's this whole idea about sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind? Friend, you can't sow sin and pray for crop failure. That's not the way it works. You can't sow sin and somehow think good and right is going to come from that. Hosea is trying to show them, you've been sowing all these seeds of unfaithfulness. You've been sowing seeds of idolatry. You've been sowing seeds of immorality, and that's going to come to fruition. You can't, I can't live a life of sin and hope one day there's not any consequences. You can't live in unfaithfulness. You can't talk like the world and live like the world and act like the world and be all caught up in the sins of the world and, and hope on judgment day there's a crop failure. It's not the way it's going to work. What we sow, we also reap. Do you remember Galatians 6, verses 6 through 10? Paul says it this way. Don't be deceived. Don't fool yourself. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. There's a day of judgment coming, and I will reap what I've sowed. Friend, as we think about winding the book of Hosea up, one of the things that God reminds his people is that they've got to break up their fallow ground. 
Look in Hosea 10, verse 12. Their heart had got hard. Their ground had got hard. It wasn't producing. And so God says in Hosea 10, verse 12, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. It is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. And so God wants them to break up that hard heart, break up that hard ground, uh, seek righteousness, put God first, sow good things in good uh, ground, and that will produce the right kind of fruit. Friend, it's possible, if we're not careful, for our hearts to get hard, for us to get stuck in a rut. For us to not be doing things for the right reason. And sometimes you've got to go in and it takes a lot of work. takes a lot of effort. You've got to break up that hard ground. But friend, although the book of Hosea is a very challenging book, I want you to see how God appeals to love for the motivation for what he's doing. Look at Hosea 11 verse 4. Look at this beautiful passage in such a difficult book. God says, I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. Think about this. God says, I'm, I'm trying to draw you to me with gentle cords. I'm reaching out to you out of love. Friend, to every person who's fallen away from God, please know God reaches out to you in kindness and in love, and he appeals to you, come back to me. That love is illustrated in this way. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Friend, if you're away from God, obey the gospel. If you've never done that, please, we beg you today, believe in Jesus as the son of God. Turn from a life of sin in repentance to him. Confess the name of Christ and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2.38, if you are a child of God and you flirted with sin, you flirted with idolatry, you're in spiritual adultery right now, please, God appeals to you, come back to him. Don't be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Join us next time as we study more from the Minor Prophets. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the Gospel of Christ.